From the New York City area, welcome to the Badass Counseling Show, where the master badass himself, Sven Erlinson, takes you deep and gives balm for the soul, baby. Hey, badasses. It's good to have you here. I'm Sven Erlinson, the host of the Badass Counseling Show. We have a lightning round for you today. We have folks tuning in from all around the world. We have one from as far away as Nepal, and it's great to have her listening on top of the world. Uh, and I think we're all a little jealous. Uh, whether you are tuning in from Victoria, British Columbia, or New Zealand, from Carbondale, Illinois, to Holden Beach, North Carolina, Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, to Denmark or Tanzania, to Tarzana, California. It's super terrific to have you here. We're taking your questions on all things life. I am joined in studio by KC over in the booth and Rob the Rocket right Ooh. next to me. What say ye? I just love being part of Badass Global. All right, me too, me too. So we're just gonna dive right in here, folks, and start taking your questions. And we are kicking it off here with... My daughter always wants to go back to young life since father's death of nine years ago. How do I help? Your daughter's desire to go back to young life. Now, it's a somewhat of an ambiguous uh, statement or question. Always wants to go back to young life um, since uh, her father's death of nine years ago. I would encourage her. I would encourage her. She's needing to go back there for some reason. What she's likely, in all likelihood, needing to do is to grieve, to feel it to experience it, to remember it, and remember her father, and feel all of those feelings. What can you do to help encourage her? Sit together and say, tell me what you're thinking about today. Tell me what you're remembering. And her memories and her fears and her pain are going to make you uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. You're going to see her in pain. You're going to see her sad. You're going to see her angry. You're going to see her mad at you, mad at God, mad at your hus husband who's now deceased, her father. And she's going to have all sorts of things. And you got to just be a vessel large enough to contain those and encourage her. And you can say things like, that must really hurt. Or one of the great questions, I use it all the time. And it's a great question. What's the hardest part right now? What are you feeling right now? Talk to me. And then let her talk. Don't try to fix her. You don't need to fix her. The fixing is you being so present and so calm inside of yourself that she can talk and you can encourage her to get it out. And the more she gets it out, the more she gets it out, the less she's going to feel the need to go back there. And all the pains and all the angers and all the sadnesses are going to flush. And eventually those will be memories glowing with warmth rather than memories laden with pain. People say, well, there are certain pains in life you can't heal from. In my experience, I've met all sorts of pains, including death of a child, including death of a parent, including you name it, and going into it and flushing and flushing and flushing. I have seen, watched, held the hand of many a people who are able to move through it, move past it, such that the pain is gone. Mm, the occasional new pain might come up regarding it, but there's so much gone that the new one is addressable. And... So keep going into it and be that vessel large enough. And that means you got to work on your own shit so that your own anxieties aren't overwhelming the situation. In other words, so there's so much room for your child's feelings and needs and griefs to run free without you having to pack them down or control them because of your own shit going on inside of you. Next question. Sven, son of Erland, <laughs> my company laid off people. How do I deal with the anxiety of that? I'm going to assume that either you are one of those people or more likely the way you're stating it, you're not one of those people because you would have said, you wouldn't have said my company laid off people. You would have said I got laid off. In all likelihood, you're dealing with the anxiety of people you love, people you know, your friends, they got laid off and am I next, right? Sort of the sword of Damocles hanging over you. When's the sword gonna fall, right? And kill me, is it going to fall? And so all you can really do is continue to do what we always do. What do we, what do, we do here at Badass Counseling. What am I always telling you guys? I, I always tell you, get to work. You got to get down, get in there, start flushing it out, writing letters, journaling, get at your therapist, talk to your therapist. This should be the only thing you're talking about. The biggest stuff is what you should be focusing on and talking about. And if you're good, if you're, you've got a dear friend or you've got a, a lover or a wife or a husband uh, so that you can talk and they, they're good listeners, go and talk to them. And what's troubling you the most about this? Uh, you know, and, and 
you know, I'm really scared. My job's going to be next. I'm afraid. What the hell am I going to do up about the money? You know, my son just started college. What the hell am I going to do? Should I get another job right away? And the more we flush out all of my, your anxieties and fears, the more your path becomes clear. It's the same way with children. Children actually generally make good decisions. They do. But where they get corrupted is either from our anxieties and our fears put into them or their own. And so if a child or if an adult is allowed to flush out their emotions regarding something, they very often make very good decisions. doesn't mean they don't make mistakes. It means they're more likely to make a decision from a point of clarity. It's always all of our supercharged emotions that fuck up our vision. All right, next question. You know, I understand that anxiety. I was in business for a long time, larger companies. Mm -hmm. There was one time we were all a little concerned they might be laying off an entire division, mm. the one I was in. Mm. And somebody in human resources, by mistake, oh, no. sent out the talking points about all the layoffs <laughs> to everybody before anybody was actually told about <laughs> that it. That was the first person fired. <laughs> I don't think so. Somehow they avoid it. Wow. What a party. I miss, aye, I, miss aye, my, aye. I miss my work. I don't miss my job. I like this work. Ah, and we wouldn't be here without you, Rob. So I'm so glad that you retired from that. But so I get the anxiety. What do you miss the most about your work, Rob, being retired? Oh, uh, you know what? A lot of it's coming back uh, by getting to do all this. So mm -hmm. I don't miss it as much. What were you I missing used, the most? I'm, I'm missing the um, being responsible for more in the entertainment industry that was um, nationwide. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They can get by without me. It's fine. Well, and you were global at some of the places you were. You were more than nationwide. Most, mostly uh, domestic U.S. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, on this notion of layoffs and, and work and, and uh, so forth, a uh, very dear buddy of mine, a uh, company that he founded about 26, 27 years ago, uh, has been, they, he's seen the writing on the wall and his industry has contracted and he's a smaller player, but he's been competing against Fortune 200 companies for years and winning or at least staying strong. And now there's such contraction and one of his biggest customers is now going, um, is now likely liquidating bankruptcy and so forth. And so his company, my buddy's company is gonna have to close. And he said, one of the things I'm struggling with, Sven, isn't just, you know, what am I gonna do for work and paying my bills? What I'm really struggling with is my identity. My identity that this work that I have done for 25 years and, and as a business owner and or in your case, Rob, uh, you know, exec, big level, high level exec in the entertainment industry, you know, what's my identity if I'm laid off from this job and if I have to switch industries? What's my identity if I retire? What's my identity if my business goes, you know, uh, tits up? What's my identity? Who am I? Don't, How, don't allow yourself to be defined by your job. But it, did you encounter that, Rob? In your, cause we, got, oh, we have a lot easy. of listeners around the world who are at the you know, end of career stage or major career transitions. And your identity, it's not just, just what you say of, of my career getting wrapped up or my identity getting wrapped up in the career, but in this particular one as well, what did you do in your retirement? How much was there loss of identity for you? It was hard. It was an adjustment. Everybody says, oh, I wish I was retired. It's not so easy. Mm. You have lost a sense of purpose mm. that was central to your Monday through Friday or maybe more. When that's gone, what do you replace it with? Mm. Do you sit and watch TV? Do you go fishing? People think, oh, that's going to be great. It's hard. It's mm. a transition. Don't ever think it isn't. Mm. Wow. That's, that's words of wisdom from the wise, from the one who has been through more than most of us, folks. Old guy. Old guy. That's just a nice way of saying you're fucking old, man. No, I'm teasing. Teasing. Yeah, no, <laughs> That's it's... right around the corner for me. So I'm not. I'm Truth not... is the best defense for slander, my friend. Ah, ooh, well played. All right. I've got Carlin over here on uh, Facebook saying, uh, with no question, just a comment. Grandson curses his mother. Simple answer. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. Some parents so want to always be the nice guy or always be the nice mom, or they always want their child to like them that they don't put boundaries in place. I am, as you all know, you wouldn't be following me on, on social media and reading my books and so on and so forth if you didn't know that I am a huge believer in the power of feelings and the power of words and the importance of flushing out pains. I mean, you, you guys hear me say this all the time, right? That it, that, that shit is so important, but, but... It's not just that, in child rearing especially. It's not just all about the child's feelings. It's not just them, you know, having safe space to, you know, express everything. You are still operating on a team. 
That child is still operating for you, lack of a better, better metaphor, you are, are operating on a team. You exist within a community known as this family. And with any, within any community, there are rules and expectations. There are chores. There are jobs. I still remember being imprinted so much. Gosh, I had to have been a teenager, maybe even late teens, when the movie Gandhi came out. Oh, yeah. 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 And I remember the scene in there where there, uh, Gandhi- uh, Ben you know, Kingsley. Ben Kingsley, right? In fake life. In real life, it was just Gandhi. His buddies did not call him Ben. Uh, and he's, they're living on a commune, I believe it was, he and his wife and so forth. And everybody had to pitch in their fair share. And he says to his wife, you know, you have to dig the latrines just like everyone else. How can we ask someone else to do it? And, she, and she's like, but I am your wife. And he's like, yeah, fuck, you're right. You help in other ways. You're right. I'll be out there. You know, whatever. It's like, allow your wife some dignity. But the point is this. We are all living on a commune of sorts, even in your own family. This is a team. Yes, there are, there's always a hierarchy or whatever, but you have to teach children chores. Children need boundaries. Children need parameters. They need clear follow through. If there are expectations and they do not follow through, you can't keep fudging those boundaries or they will expand their doing, uh, they're not complying with rules. And there have to be rules. There have to be, and you have to follow through. Even if your poor child is whining and giving you crocodile tears, there has to be follow through. Children need to learn chores. Do you wanna know one, and this is shocking to me, Rob, and I wanna hear your feedback on this. Okay. I know you grew up in a family business in New Jersey. Uh, family business was a bakery, right? Uh, on my father's side. Yeah. On your father's side, okay. Uh, but as far as your parents, uh, that may be different. But um, the only reason I bring this up is because one of the things that I have learned in, uh, that it was really new to me that I did not understand from my own personal experience from so many clients over the years, and I hear it a lot from uh, men, young men, and by young, I mean, let's say in their 30s or 40s. I was never taught anything by my parents. I was never guided. I was never shown how to do anything. And I just really felt like I wasn't important. I wanted to be taught how to be a man, how to be a guy, how to, I was never taught how to do laundry by my mom. I was never taught how to turn a wrench by my dad or operate a, a, you know, a drill press or a table saw, or I was never taught how to just add my own oil or add my own, you know, um, how to know, well, boy, if I'm driving and it's cold, and my car isn't heating up. I was never taught that you got to add antifreeze. I get it. I was there. I mean, were they, you they, were you yeah, taught growing no, up, Rob? I was not taught, but I was given tools so I could teach myself, and I mostly did. But I wish I had been taught. Well, what do you mean you were given tools so you could teach yourself? Well, I mean, you were a kid. What were you yeah, given? No, well, kid, young teenager. Okay, let's say. Actual tools. Okay. Actual pieces of electronic gear. Oh, I wow. could get whatever I needed to. To get that uh -huh. was all provided. Uh -huh. What do I do with it? And by the way, how do you become a man? Mm -hmm. Now nah, that that wasn't there. Uh huh. And you know what's interesting? And so you model. You know, you just look at the other men. Okay, I guess that's what men are. Uh, what's interesting in my life? The reason it was never, I never got this at first. And the reason I find it so fascinating in people that I uh, have counseled, particularly men, is because I grew up with a father who never stopped talking. And he was always like, and Sven, here's what an engine does. And come on out here and, and hold the flashlight. Dad, it's fucking 20 below. I don't want to hold a flashlight in a cold garage. So that was the one thing. I never learned cars. But, you know, and here's how you, you raise and lower a seat. I'd say, okay, Dad, raise my seat, please. Um, and then he, but he taught, he taught us how to do it, how to put a chain back on the sprocket when it's gone off and how to, you know, garden. My parents taught me all this shit. And I, I hated a lot of it when I was young. Not because I hated work. His dad was always pumping shit into me, right? And sometimes he'd tell the same story four times. Well, back on the machine shed that we had on the farm, you know, in, in you know, 1938, we blah, blah, blah. It's like, fuck me, dad. <laughs> but, 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 damn, I'm grateful that he did that. Damn, I am grateful. I am a good gardener, even though I really hate gardening. But guess what? My girlfriend likes pretty flowers and dragonflies and butterflies and it's nice to, and hummingbirds and I love to be able, and pretty flowers. I love to be able to give that gift. You're all set. I mean, I can appreciate being self-sufficient, but when I would ask my father mm. a question about what do I do here? How does this work? He would say, what will you do when I'm not here? Oh, interesting. 
So yes, I became a little more self-sufficient, but I wish she had told me a little more. Well, you know, and that's really an interesting because what I what's implicit in that response is actually a response that I encourage parents to give their kids more. And that is really the phrase, and it's an extraordinarily powerful phrase to tell children uh, and young teenagers, even when they make, make mistakes, actually, especially when they make mistakes, is you make good decisions you, and be sincere and say, yeah, you made a mistake. Okay, don't ask me how many mistakes I've made just this week. Making mistakes is part of it, but you know, okay, what'd you do wrong? What'd you write? But also, how does it feel? I feel frustrating and I'm such an idiot. No, you're not. And flush out the feelings and then go back to trusting your own gut and you'll get better and better and better at it. But so I like what he said on one hand, okay. but on the other hand, another way of approaching that with both elements, perhaps, and tell me how this would have rung for you. Maybe good, maybe not. Um, here's, if I were in your situation, son, this is what I would do. Okay, and this is what your uncle Steve would do. He might do it a little bit differently because this is sort of how he looks at it. So there are a couple options for you, but what feels right to you, Rob? Now that combination would have been very, very welcome. And in the case of learning how to drive, go see your cousin Jerry because he is a driver ed instructor at a high school. Bingo. And so the way my cousin Jerry taught me to drive, this was in New Jersey. He says, we're going out on Route 22 for your first lesson. You're gonna figure it out. You ever, if you know anything about Route 22 in New no, Jersey, that's where they invented the New Jersey barrier because so many people were getting killed <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah, you'll figure it out real quick out there. And so I did. Wow. Throw, throw the kid in the pool, he'll learn to swim. Hopefully, uh, in most cases. Or not. <laughs> or not, right? You'll be in the New Jersey barrier. No, and um, as, far, as far as kids swearing at grownups, mm -hmm. that's your favorite scene from Talladega Nights, dude. What, Chip, the old man? <laughs> Chip, I, I threw your medals, your World War II medals in the river right now. Why, you little, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump up and scissor kick you. I'm a spider monkey, I'm a spider monkey. I love that. Anywho, how, no, absolutely unacceptable. Carlin, the original comment was, grandson curses his mother, shut that shit down. One of the things that's so powerful in parental relationships, or in this case, grandparent and parent, you can do it, um, is uh, I love parental relationships where one parent is protecting the honor of the other parent, where one parent is saying, in this house, you don't talk to your father that way. You don't, that's not okay. I need you to go sit in the corner for, for you know, three minutes. Please don't talk to your father that way. It doesn't require yelling and screaming. Just if I'm the, the mother, that's not okay. Or if, you're, or if I'm the father and saying to, you know, the wife or the other father, if uh, it's a uh, gay um, couple, is saying, no, you don't treat your mother that way, son. Or young lady, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's not okay. You know we don't talk to your mother that way, all right? I, that's not okay. You need to go up to your room for a little bit and take a little time, okay? And then you go up and you talk with them and how does it feel and so on and so forth and let them flush out the feelings. But we have to be protecting the spirit of other people in the house. And it's the same way with the children. They have every right to be treated with respect as well. But a, a grandson uh, cursing his mother, absolutely unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable. If the, but teaching the child how to express their feelings, if they're feeling frustration or anger or sadness, teaching them how to do it in appropriate ways, but cursing another human, if that's allowed at a young age, that shit's only gonna expand. And before you know it, if the, if the mother is not protecting her own spirit, if the mother is not you know, uh, disciplining the child, and it doesn't require a swat on the butt or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, telling the teacher, if you can't be firm with your own child, that power of that little child is gonna expand, it actually already has, expand beyond their ability to exercise their power judiciously, all right? where a child has so much power, but they don't know what to do with it. That's a bad situation. That's where we sort of have that old phrase, the inmates running the asylum, where we have children with way too much power. Parents cannot be afraid to be the parent. And we can't just be kumbaya all the time, that there have to be clear parameters, clear disciplines. My children always used to say, my nephews and nieces used to say, oh, at Uncle Sven's house, there are so many rules, but we have so much fun, all right? You exist within a system and there are clear rules and there are clear follow through every single time every single time. And it's not bad. It's, you know, the law of proportionate response. All right. You know, just because I, you know, steal your goat doesn't mean give you a right to go and slaughter my children. That's disproportionate. Right. So in the case of children that if, you know, you, you hit your brother, yeah, you get a fucking time out, but I'm not going to wallop you or something like that. It just makes no sense. All right, let's move on. 
That was a great fucking riff, man. We were doing some fucking Jimi Hendrix shit there. Right. No, I'm not comparing myself to Jimi Hendrix. It's a fucking metaphor. All right. Got it. Got it. I got a good one. Here we go. Uh, Mel asks, how do you know when it's time to give up on marriage counseling? If one person isn't doing the work and has on a few occasions lied to the therapist, is there any point? Yeah. Um, if the other person has given up or isn't trying, what are you going to do? You can only build a bridge halfway across a river, so to speak. All right, if the other person's not willing to do the work, it's really not even marriage counseling. We're just, we're just fucking around here, you know? We're just wasting time, wasting money. And in that case, what do you do? You get yourself a personal therapist and you go in for personal fucking counseling. You work on you because what you've come to is the realization that this person, despite your pleading, despite your trying to converse with them and, and convey to them the importance of us both doing the work, of both of us digging deep inside of ourselves, despite your efforts to convey that to your spouse, they are unwilling to do the work. So what you've fundamentally got is that you have someone that you are going to and saying, this is important to me. And they're saying, fuck off. I'm not the problem. You're the problem. Go fuck yourself. I mean, it's like uh, you having a customer saying, you know what? On this car that you've been selling me, on these, uh, you know, whatever, this line of cars, you know, you keep having this problem with the fly nut, you know, and it's causing engine breakdown. Yeah, we don't care. Fuck off. We don't care. <laughs> your customer relationship, yeah, it's, it's highly unlikely people are going to keep buying your car. So in the case that you get good, good personal counseling, because you likely are going to have to walk away from the relationship. Now, one thing I do want to bring up in that question, you said, or they're lying in counseling. Uh, that's one of the things about marriage counseling. There's so much lying back and forth or expanding the truth or my problems are bigger than your problems or my issues are bigger than your issues or he's not telling it the way I see it or she's you know misquoting whatever. This is why I never take couples together to begin with in counseling. I usually do two, three, four, five individual sessions with the clients before I ever bring them together. Why? It's just the flying shit show of he said, she said. It's like, like I, yeah, like I want to spend, waste my fucking day untying that fucking knot. Just have you guys be heaping on more shit. It, it, I just, I'm so opposed to that. Now, some therapists do it and do it well, and God bless you. God bless you. For me, I want to help two individuals become who the fuck they really are, then look at each other and decide, do I want to be with this person? And then we can build a relationship. But you're not being your authentic self, and this relationship was built on inauthentic versions of each of you. That shit's got to be healed before you can solve the fucking relationship problem. All right. Much more to come right after this very short break. I had a really good start in my life, and I've been successful in my career, but I have to say I've learned so much and improved my outlook on life since I met Sven and picked up a copy of Badass Wisdom. With the daily meditations as journaling prompts, I've uncovered a lot of memories that weren't totally pleasant. With Sven's guidance, I've achieved some new understanding, and honestly, I feel lighter. Badass Wisdom is a great read, in nice small bites, and I think anyone can benefit from it. So go to badasscounseling.com and get the book, or the audiobook. It could change your life. This show provides soul counseling intended to entertain and inform, and is not medical advice. Now, back to the badass. All right, let's get to work, badasses. I've got two questions that are similar here. Uh, one uh, over on Facebook and one here on TikTok. Do alcoholics ever feel remorse for things they say to you? And then I've got Stephanie over on YouTube, excuse me, on Facebook asking this question. When addiction is present, when do you have to just let go of the entire relationship? When... I feel it's not them, it's the drug and drug psychosis causing the trouble, but I'm over all the BS. So we're asking two very similar questions, not the same, but similar. So I'm gonna loop them together, but I'm gonna take Tracy first. Do alcoholics ever feel remorse for things they do? Sure, sure, absolutely. Some very much do. Some aren't, don't, and don't wanna feel those crappy feelings of what they've done. You know, I mean, but that's true of anything. That's not just alcoholics. That's true of men, women children, you know, there are times some who want to feel those feelings and honor it and feel that natural empathy, empathy, remorse, uh, compassion, regret, guilt. Those are all natural human emotions. There's no emotion that is foreign to all of humanity. We all have it in us. I mean, unless you've been born with some type of um, uh, disease uh, that cuts you off from some of that stuff, but that's, that's out of the scope of what we're talking about here, okay? Yes, they have the ability to feel it, but the real question is, Tracy, um, do they 
feel it and not just feel it. Really, in the end, the feeling, them feeling remorse or even expressing the remorse. I am so sorry for what I've done to you, sweetheart. I am when I've been drinking, I have been a you know, da 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 da, and here's what I've done wrong, and so forth. Expressing it is one thing, but as we all know, those apologies are great, but are they followed up with action? And furthermore, do they, or the abuse cycle, do they apologize and then go back and keep doing it? Apologize, do it, apologize, do it, apologize, do it. And that's where we sort of get over to Stephanie here. When Stephanie says, when addiction is present, when do you have to just let go of the entire relationship? Um, and so when we're seeing the patterns that they're not doing the work of actually changing long-term, okay? I got it in this notion of changing long-term. I get into a relationship that I've been in for 10 years now. Uh, we just tr- crossed our 10-year mark. And um, when we got in in the beginning, she flat out said, she said, Sven, you know, I know you counsel people for a living and, you know, you're really into the self-help stuff. And I'm just, I'm fearful that I'm not as far along as you or whatever. I said, I don't give a shit about that. I said, all I care is that you're doing 1% more work today than you did yesterday to become your authentic self. The only thing that I'm gonna, that's gonna cause me to lose attention with anyone in my intimate relationships is when they're not being authentic or striving to become a little bit more authentic. My second wife, she was a Broadway dancer. We literally met when she was starring in the national tour of a Broadway show, okay? And I said to her, you know, my first wife used to laugh at me for dancing. In high school, they laughed at me. I was such a bad dancer, worse than Elaine on Seinfeld. And, uh, and my second wife, is, she said to me, that's just dumb, man. I'm around dancers all day. I couldn't give two shits if you dance or not. If we go to a wedding or something, I'll dance with the old guy who still does the Lindy. I'll, I'll dance with you. I don't care. My ego is not wrapped up in whether or not my you know, boyfriend, eventually husband can dance. I don't care. And that's how I was really when I met my present girlfriend 10 years ago. It's like, it's just, as long as you're making an effort to just be yourself more, that's what I care. It's about the effort. So when it comes to somebody in, you know, somebody struggling with addiction, or somebody struggling with mental illness, or somebody struggling with whatever the hell they're struggling with, career issues, financial issues. The, to me, the question is, are they trying? Are they genuinely trying to get you know 1% better a day, so to speak? Are they just bits and pieces? Are they trying? Because I personally, I admire that. And that's showing not just effort, but sincere effort. And they give a shit about themselves. They give a shit about me. And uh, But then you bring up this last piece, and you say... Um, when I feel it's not them, it's the drug and the drug uh, psychosis causing the trouble, but I'm over all the BS. Okay, I'm a little bit of a stickler on this when it comes, particularly when it comes to addictions, uh, drug use, uh, alcohol use, whatever it might be. And there are plenty of addictions, gambling, all sorts of addictions, food, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the ones that change your state, so many people in relationship with someone who has an addiction are angry at them when they are drunk, when they are stoned when they are high or out of it or whatever on whatever drug it might be and they're mad at them when they're in the state because they can't stand it because that's when they are their worst self that's when the addict is their worst self i said you know i get that i really do i've been in relationship with people struggling with addiction i get that that's the part that hurts that's the part that's sad that's the part where they take it out on you all that but really deep down that's not the person you're mad at you're mad at the person that's sober and, and so many people are like, Sven, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. No, when they're sober, that's the one I like. I said, no, I mean, yes, but no, deep down, it's that's the one you hate. Well, why is that, Sven? Because that's the one that chooses to not be sober tomorrow. It's the sober one that is choosing to not go into rehab and keep working at it. It's the sober one that chooses to take that first drink. You are at your highest heights of power not when you're drunk or weak or stoned, but when you are in fact sober. And it's the sober one choosing to not change. So really, deep down, it's the sober one you're most mad at. And that's the anger, that's the stuff. And so when is it okay to walk away is your question. You know that they get in the, this drug-induced psychosis and so forth, and they cause trouble. And I feel bad for them that they're in this uh, addiction, but it's just too much for me. You get out when it's too much for you. Or if you've been in that sort of relationship with someone and it's gotten to be too much and you're in another relationship and holy shit, I find myself in someone who's uh, you know, addicted to whatever, you, <laughs> you don't wait for it to, that, to get to that point this time. You go earlier, why? Because you know where it's going.
that if they aren't showing the effort, you catch it much, much sooner. And that is one of the beauty of experiencing pain in relationships. The more extreme pain you experience in a relationship, you are far more likely in your next relationship to lower that pain threshold and catch it sooner and listen to your gut sooner. Why? Because you know exactly where the fuck it's going. It's like, listen, I love you, but I gotta go. All right, next question. Here we go. You got some hearts on the live stream during that answer. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, to which Nicole Lynn over on TikTok says, dry drunks are almost worse than an active user, in my opinion. All right, next question. What have we got? Here we go. Oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. Uh, And it's a reference to my book, There's a Hole in My Love Cup. And Tuck Cass asks, why would someone be nervous to start the journaling process of the first chapter? Am I not ready? Okay, so Tuck Cass is obviously referring to him or herself or their self. And I hear this so much. I have people say, Sven, I ordered your book, or Sven, I'm terrified to order your book, or I did order it, but it's been sitting on my bed stand for a month, or Sven, I read the introduction, broke out in tears, I haven't opened it since, or Sven, I got to the end of the first chapter. And the end of the first chapter, I believe, is where the first question is asked, and I gotta apologize to every reader on this one. But at the end of the first chapter, I believe it's the first chapter, I asked the question, okay, I asked several questions, and then you use them as prompts for your journaling. And one of them is, what is the single biggest trauma of your life? Now start journaling on that. (laughs) I get people saying, Sven, I got five fucking big traumas, which one do I choose? I get people saying, Sven, I don't remember anything from my childhood, right? Which is a very common experience. You know, it's a survival mechanism of children. They forget things so they don't have to deal with pain. Or I get people saying, Sven, I don't even know. Or like Truck Cass is saying, Potentially, Sven, I don't even want to touch that. And people will close the book at the end of the first chapter. Now, I apologize because what I should have said, put in there is start with something small. (laughs) If you can't think of the big one or don't want to touch the big one, just start with last week when your coworker, uh, you know, chewed you out for no reason. It hurt and you got pissed off. Start there. Start your journaling there. Start with something small. And the more we do the smalls and the mediums, we get better prepared for the bigs. Or remember something from your past that isn't as big and start there. Uh, But your question is, why would someone be nervous to start the journaling process? I get people who are saying, whether they're in the book or not, Sven, oh, I don't like to write. I don't like to journal. Or when I require an autobiography of a client, they say, I don't like to write. I don't like to write. And my question is always, um, if if I'm on a FaceTime with them or a Zoom or whatever, I'll say, uh, just take your camera there on the FaceTime or on the Zoom. Show me your desk. Well, they'll pick it up and they'll show me their desk and they'll be, you know, their calendar. If they use a day calendar, you know, that's not in their phone or there'll be notes or there'll be a, you know, letter they're working on to one of their, uh, you know, whatever kids or an, one of their executives or whatever it is. And I'll say, oh, so you have no problems with writing, do you? And they're like, well, that's not what I mean. No, that is it. Writing is writing. Words are words. All right. Uh, I, I don't care about your grammar. Just tell me the story of your life or in journaling, You know, your spelling ability doesn't fuck, but I said, I don't like to write. No, what it is for so many people is I don't like to write about what your questions are wanting me to write about. It's not the act of writing, it's the substance of what I'm writing about. Pain, sadness, fear, anger, rage, hatred, disappointment, whatever it might be, failure, right? And so why would someone be nervous? Because there's so much fucking pain in there and you're probably not wanting to touch it because you know, once you start going in, it's like, oh fuck, here we go. And that's why a lot of people shy away from counseling. It's too uncomfortable. I mean, you ask any fucking therapist, and we have tons of therapists, psychologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, clergy who follow the show, who read my books, who comment in comments. We have lots of them. In fact, we were supposed to be doing a session with one literally right now, a uh, counseling session, but uh, she got sick. So we hope she comes back. But one of you ask any therapist, how many clients have you ever had quit because it became uncomfortable for them? And they'll be like, oh shit, I haven't got enough time to make that fucking list, Right? What's so uncomfortable about counseling, if you got a good therapist, is they want to take you down in the uncomfortable shit. And if you aren't willing to go there, you ain't going to reap the benefits. It's just going to be this bullshit. Oh, let's talk about our week and oh, blah, blah, blah. No, you got to go down in the really uncomfortable shit. And so why would someone be nervous to start the journaling process? Because the fear of going into it all uh, seems overwhelming and you're fear, feeling it all again. And that is normal. It is a normal response to an abnormal set of circumstances. And the abnormal set of circumstances that you're about to for the very first time in your life, you've been spending your whole life running from that tidal wave of all your pain, your fears, and your bullshit beliefs from in your past. And you are about to turn into that tidal wave and it's gonna wash over you and you fear, Sven, it'll explode me, it'll overwhelm me. Yeah, it will do those things at times. But you start small and just take it in bite-sized chunks. It's just like anything else. Rob, you got a niche? Um, generally. All right. Cause if not, I got a couple here. I got a question here. Okay. How do I not feel guilty when I walk away from the narcissist mother and brother, a lifetime of manipulation from them? Isn't it fascinating that you feel guilty? 
Isn't that fascinating? Isn't it fascinating that you're, this person is saying, how do I, what do I do with guilt that I feel over walking away from a narcissist mother-in-law or mother-in-law and brother-in-law? Mother, mother and brother. Mother and brother, not even in-laws. Okay, well, guilty because, you know, family is family and it's my mom. I hear that one all the time. People don't want to confront their real shit in their life because, you know, you don't speak that way about your dad or it's your parents and you should never let go. And, you know, so the guilt makes total sense. That is such a normal reaction to that. That is such a common thing. A lot of times people don't want to address family stuff or they're forever excusing. My, well, I understand, you know, mom had a really bad childhood or I, gee, I, you know, dad did his best. I forgive him after mom died. You know, he's a, he was a guy and he's a different era. They will always excuse the, 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 the parents' actions or the siblings' actions. They're always excusing, right? Which, and it's that excusing. It's making their feelings in your brain, it's making their feelings more important than your feelings, which is precisely what's created these problems in the whole first place. You are conditioned to believe that everybody else's feelings, specifically mom and brother, are more important than yours, that their feelings, their wants, their needs are more important than yours. And so how do you walk away without feeling guilty? You can't. Of course you're going to feel guilty. Of course you're going to feel guilty. All right, that's very normal. And the worse the treatment by them, over time that will diminish that guilt, but it, there's still going to be some there. But largely, you know, I've had people suffer extreme abuse. And so they reach a point where I, I don't feel guilty at all walking away, I, where they finally hear their own voice so much that they feel no guilt. But generally, yeah, if you have to walk away from family to protect yourself or walk away from a lover or walk away from a dear friend or walk away to save yourself and to get your life back, yeah, there's going to be, oh, how do you deal with it? You go into it. You let yourself feel it. The cure for the pain is in the pain, as Rumi the poet said. Right, You have to go into it and allow it to come and feel it and flush it out. And these are the tools that I teach in the book. There's a hole in my love cup. Uh, was there a follow-up on that one, one, Rob, or am I moving forward? That's it. Go right ahead. All right. Well, it's funny because that is exactly over here on TikTok what Amy just asked. Why do I feel guilty when I stand up for myself? I always feel like the bad guy. That's exactly right. And so it's not just that you're walking away from family or in Amy's case, walking away from anyone. It's just that you have been conditioned to believe that your feelings aren't important. You have been conditioned to believe that your wants, your needs, your boundaries don't matter. One of the things I tell people is that uh, I had a client just this week, and this is very, very common in my practice. I probably had more than one this week, but I'm re registering one in particular, who said, you know, I, I didn't really start being angry until my late 30s, Sven. I said, that's fascinating. You know, in some homes, certain feelings aren't allowed. In some homes, nobody's allowed to be happy. You know, if one of the kids starts having success or whatever, maybe the parent undermines it. Or in some homes, you're not allowed, they aren't allowed to be sad. If, I'll tell, give you something to cry about, little lady. Or big boys don't cry. In some homes, anger isn't allowed. But in some homes, there's just feelings aren't allowed, whatever it is, till eventually the child finds their anger. And I love it when a client finally finds their anger. If I've got uh, clients that are always calm or always sweet or whatever, I love it when I finally get them to the point of looking at everything and digging it up that they find their anger. Why? I have a saying that I like to say, and it's simply this, and it applies to adults, but I, I mo mostly say it with kids. Children shout loudest when feeling heard least. Children, nations, peoples, shout loudest when feeling heard least, okay? And so what that indicates is if, I, if this adult client that I was telling you about, let's just say someone's in their late 30s and they finally find their anger, what's inside of that anger is, is their no, Scariest word in the English language when where children is no. No, you can't have that candy bar in the checkout line at the grocery store. No, you can't go to band camp. Feels yucky to feel no. But when we're adults, scariest word in the English language is saying the word no. No, I don't want to do that. No, that doesn't feel good to me. No, that's not fair. No, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. We just can't make it for dinner or whatever it is. No, it's hard to say it. It's scary. Because no is an indicator of who I am, what my boundaries are. But what's fascinating, so inside of the anger is the word no. When someone finds their word, their no, rising up from within, that's when life begins. Life begins at the word no. But why? Because inside of the word no is the word I. I don't like how this feels. No, you can't treat me this way. No, I don't want you to say those things to me. I. So when someone finally finds their anger, when someone finally finds their no, what they are really finding is their I. And this is the beginning of the destruction of the old bullshit beliefs you were taught about yourself, that you are finally breaking through, that the guilt, you no longer feel guilty for expressing your I. And so when I'm down there jackhammering that cement in someone's soul with all the bullshit messages that got written into it, what naturally breaks through is that bedrock that's always been there that affirms the worth of the I. So where are you at in your process? 
Is your anger there? Or maybe it's your sadness. Inside your sadness is this hurts me. Me, I, inside of the sadness is your I. Have you found your I? How far along are you in finding your I? All right, follow up. There, Go ahead. There is follow up from the woman who felt guilty about walking away. All right. I'm starting your book, Your Way of Putting This, already gave me some clarity. I'll be okay doing this. Thank you. Good, good. And you'll even be more okay the more you just keep uh, flushing all that out. But finding those things, where did I get those fucking messages that my feelings aren't important? Where was I taught that? Either explicitly or implicitly. And 95% of the time it's in the home. She just said, I'm 57, almost 58. I'm done. Good. Yeah. I love that. I'm done. No. Dang it. No. Right? Exactly. All right. I love that. Love it. Love it. And Jillian says here on TikTok, my no's are protecting my inner peace. It's taken so, in capital letters, so long to get there. Love that. Love that. All right. And I can be taught, you know, teaching children that their eye is important. Now, that doesn't mean a child always gets what they want. Don't conflate these two things. In fact, one of the best things that a child can learn is this. See, a lot of parents are afraid to say no, and I think we all see that. You know, it's in this, that isn't new to this generation. That's been around where, and, and that's where we get the bullying kids or the tyrant little child, two-year-old or whatever, or eight-year-old, whatever it might be. Um, so many parents are afraid to say no. They think, well, I have to honor the child's eye by giving them everything they want. No. One of the best things a child can learn is, no, you're not going to get what you want, but I still love you. In, in when I was uh, disciplined or punished for doing something bad as a child, my mother and father gave us the great gift, the great gift of saying, Sven, you're not a bad person. You just did a bad thing. Okay. No, in other words, no, that behavior is not allowed, but that is not a reflection of your identity. No, Sven, you're not a bad person. So they're calling out the bad behavior, but you're not a bad person. All right. So it's divorcing identity from those actions that they are calling out as bad. Well, it's the same way in giving a no to a child. No, you're, I'm sorry. We, you're, you're not getting the go-kart, Sven. I'm sorry. You know, whether it's we can't afford it or it's just it's not in the budget right now or just no, it's not, uh, you know, appropriate for your age or just no. And that's okay. You can't be afraid to say no to a child. Otherwise, the child's power expands and their sense that they are the center of the universe expands. That's not okay. That's not okay. That they need to, uh, as the great rabbi said, we must all remember that we are simultaneously the center of the universe and nothing. That's brilliant. That's the way to walk through life. I love that. Uh, let's move along. How do we cope with only child syndrome? I have to be very honest. I don't know what only child syndrome is as a syndrome. Um, not a psychologist. I am a soul counselor. Um, I'm going to speculate based on what you call on what you call it. Only child syndrome. I'm going to guess, and forgive me if I'm guessing wrong, but this notion that a person was the only child, and so they became sort of the center of the world, golden child. Um, and golden children, of course, are not unique to single children homes. Uh, also, all the triangulation that goes with it, blah, 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 blah. But this notion of it being a syndrome, this notion that I'm the center of the world always, how do you deal with it? Presumably, if you're the person in a relationship, adult relationship, is that what we're talking about here? Uh, you're in a relationship with somebody who thinks they're the center of the world. <laughs> Good luck with that one. No, uh, just kidding around. Um, what you do is you hold your boundaries. You, you state when you're feeling hurt, you state what your needs are, and you do not back down. You do not back down. If you've got somebody who's an extreme taker or who is inclined to steamrolling others to get their own way, you do not back down. You hold your boundaries. You say what your needs are. You say what your feelings are. You say when you're being hurt. And if it is not honored, you get the fuck out of there because they're just going to fucking steamroll you. They are going to wear you down. Wear you down. All right. All right. This is a question we see a lot, and I'm going to hit it, and I'm going to hit it quickly because you guys have heard me address this one before, but it's one that uh, never gets old, and it's simply this. Uh, how do you know when to leave? Now, they don't say whether it's a job, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a relationship. I know this is going to seem a bit sort of arcane or a bit, you know, a little nebulous because it is, because there is no hard and fast rule when it's always the time to leave a relationship or a career or whatever. What there is is there's an inner sense of knowing, and so if you're still wondering if it's time yet, it's not time. I don't believe in forced action. I don't believe in something why well, I, I, I really, I, I, gotta, I gotta just do it. I gotta, I gotta force myself. No, 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 Just wait until you know. 
And the truth is when it's time to leave, you will know. It will, you will feel it so strongly and so clearly that you will know. That doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. It doesn't mean it isn't gonna, you know, if you're not gonna have feelings of guilt or sadness or whatever. But it's like, you're just gonna, you're gonna be going through the produce aisle at the grocer one day. Or you're gonna be just closing the gas cap on your gas tank at the gas station. Use gas three times there in one sentence. And you're gonna be closing that gas tank and you're gonna be like, it's time. And you're gonna know. So the truth is, I always tell people, just let it go for now. I know you feel obsessed and everything's going worse and worse. How do I let it go? Just to, There's no rush to act. There's no rush. It'll be there tomorrow. That decision will be there tomorrow. But here's the truth. Here's what's going to happen. Until you are ready, your pain's going to get worse. Problems don't magically solve themselves, guys. Okay. So whether it's uh, life, career, relationships, friendship, uh, whether to leave a geography because it's bad for your health or whatever, um, until it's time, until you have that sense of clarity, just keep moving forward and your pain's going to get worse. And that really heightens your clarity. Pain is a wonderful, horrific teacher. Brutal, but uh, the pain is always teaching us. That's why running from the pain, sometimes we have to cope, don't get me wrong, but running from your pain is one of life's biggest mistakes because pain is holding in its terrible claw the most beautiful gems of wisdom, you, the, the keys to your authentic self and your healing, you're finally coming alive, are inside of all of your pain. Once you have the courage to crack that nut open, oh, life begins to unfold in ways you can't imagine. And I know that sounds like really crazy ass shit, but it's fucking true. All right. Why do people say they understand when they haven't been through what you've been through? And that's fair. That's a good question. So if somebody came to me and said, you know, Sven, you know, when you say you understand what it's like to lose a child, if I have a client who has lost a child, first of all, I wouldn't say that. What I would say is this. I have never lost a child. I'm just gonna name this person Susie. Susie, I have never lost a child. And I want you to teach me what it's like. I want you to tell me what you're feeling. I want you to tell me, please help me understand. Even though I, of course, have never gone through it and will never fully understand it. Teach me as much as you can. And there'll be times, or there'll be times when I'll say to someone, um, you know, I honestly have never lost a child, all right? But I have been in a situation, in situations in life where I wanted to end my own life, where I felt it had lost all meaning, where I had lost everything that was important to me because I had my children illegally taken from me. That's my authentic experience in life, okay? So I don't understand, but there are things probably similar. Help me understand what's different. So you ask the question, Elizabeth, why do people say they understand when they haven't been through what you've been through? A, very often, they're trying to be consoling. They don't mean harm. Often people say, oh, I, I understand, I understand. And they don't. And it's insulting, right? Isn't that really what you're saying? It's insulting. You want to say, shut the fuck up. You don't know what I've been through, right? But very often they're trying. And it's hard when you're the one in pain to sort of have to be gracious to their attempts. You wish they were better at it, but it sounds, oftentimes it, they are trying. Now, sometimes people will say that just to make it go away. Oh, I understand, I understand. It's like, fuck you, just shut the fuck up, okay? But some people are trying. Um, and so it's either coming from a place of trying to dismiss you and they don't wanna deal with your shit or it's coming from an authentic place and they genuinely are trying to understand and God bless them for at least fucking trying. Because the truth is so many people don't know what to do with someone else's pain. Have you ever gone to a funeral and been un uncomfortable because you didn't know what to say? I was a fucking pastor. Do you know how many funerals I've done in my life? I still get uncomfortable at funerals. No lie. I've done more funerals than, and I went to funerals as a kid with my dad. Mom would say, oh, go with your dad. He has to go, because dad was a pastor. He has a funeral today. Go with dad. Because <laughs> she has six kids. So it's like, if I can pawn one or two off on the old man, great. I get a little more quiet here at the house while I'm making the next meal and doing all this fucking laundry. And I've been to so many funerals and I still get uncomfortable because it's like, you, you, especially if it's like, you know, my girlfriend's uh, cousin, you know, that lost and they don't really, we don't really know each other. And, you know, and so the standards are, I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. That's a nice one. Or just, you know, I'm sorry and uh, nice to see you, but I'm so sorry it's under these circumstances. You know, something like that. Uh, but the truth is some people just don't know how to deal with other people's pain. And you know what? Honestly, kind of that's okay. Saying you understand someone else's pain, if you haven't been through it, it's a tough one. You better walk, tread gingerly through that because that is, can be offensive to the person. Go ahead, Rob. On dealing uh, with your own pain, that topic here, are two similar ones. Okay. Uh, Holly says, I found I have to take a few days before I feel ready to take on your journal prompts in your book. Is that normal or should I push through feeling overwhelmed? And then Sydney says, I want to flush out the pain, but when I go to do so, it's like I can't even though I want to. Right, right. And in the case of I can't even though I want to, 
there's probably some blockage there. And what I would honestly do is just ask yourself in your journaling, why is it? What's really going on inside of me that is blocking me from doing the, jour the journaling on, let's just say it's on chapter, I'm just going to make one up, 16. I don't even know what the hell chapter 16 is. And, and it's dealing with, you know, um, anger, let's just say, and anger at, you know, your ex. Well, you know, I really, I know I have anger towards my ex and I want to go into it, but for some reason I can't journal on this. And I've tried to do it each of these days. All right, so leave the anger at the ex on the side and journal about what's really going on inside of me. Is it fear of addressing that? Fear of feeling all those feelings? Is it that I have something else? It's just in front of it. I, what I, I guess what I'm realizing is I'm really pissed off at my 23 year old son because he's really being a fucking prick lately. And journal about that. Something's in the way. But there is some blockage between you and that pain. Maybe it's your fear. Maybe it's your guilt of even considering that, gee, um, you know, this man who has provided for me and I've provided for him, but I, I feel guilty talking about what's wrong with my husband because he's such a nice guy. Whatever it might be, there's some blockage. So leave the anger itself off to the side and tackle what's the blockage, what's going on inside of me. Okay, so, but that was the second question. What was the first one there though, Rob? The first one, I feel like I have to take a few days before I feel ready to take on the journal oh, yeah. prompts. Should I just push through? I feel overwhelmed. Uh, I mean, honestly, the goal in all of this work, folks, is to have a communion with your own soul. That when your soul is speaking, you trust it and you honor it. And sometimes, very often, in trusting and honoring the movements of our own soul and the calling of your own soul, it's more often or very often a call to inaction. It's not always a call to action. One of the first things I did uh, coming out of my uh, first marriage when I had my first apartment, um, and I was so I was under so much pressure in my 20s to do, 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 and get a job, get a better job, get to do this, you know, be in action, 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 that I took an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and a Sharpie marker, and I wrote two words on it, and I taped that right above my bed. And it simply said, do nothing. Now, I still had bills to pay, of course, and, you know, trying to be involved in my kids' lives and so forth. But beyond that, do nothing. Give yourself permission to do nothing, to slow the fuck down, to give yourself to solve. And what I needed, I needed solitude. I needed to slow down. I needed to give myself permission to hear my own soul rather than all these other voices saying, do, 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 do. Act, 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 action. Okay, and so what I'm getting at here is um, if, you, if it doesn't feel right to journal on a given day, let it go. That's okay. That's okay. And there are going to be times when you know you have to push through something and where it's like, no, I actually want to push through this today. I know I have a big blockage here, but I'm ready. I want to push through. But the goal is you to trust your own gut. There's no hard and fast rule, the, except the hard and fast rule is, are you listening to your own self? And if your own self is saying, I need rest from all of this, then honor it. One of the things I tell every single one of my clients after our first session, if it's been like a six hour session or even a four or five, um, which they all have to be between four and six. Um, most people say, take the six. And a lot of people think, that's crazy. I could never sit still for six hours. Trust me, it goes very fast. But what I always tell clients at the end of it is, we have uncovered so much today and you have been through the ringer today and you have seen things you did not even know existed from your past and inside of you. I strongly recommend that you take a few days or a week and just go easy on yourself. No major life decisions, just go easy on yourself. Give yourself extra rest. Give yourself half a day off on a Tuesday or you know whatever it is, go easy on yourself. And it's the same way with all the work that I give you in my books. There's a hole in my love cup or my book, Badass Wisdom. Go easy on yourself. There's no rush. And the truth is there are going to be times where you want to pick up your speed. It's like uh, when you're in track, when we were in track in high school, uh, our coach had a thing called fart licks. <laughs> I don't know why. And where you, no, truly, that's what they were called, fart licks. And fart licks were you get on the track and you do a sprint at 200 for 200 meters, right? Then you walk for 50 meters. Then you do a jog for 800 meters. Then you do a sprint for 50 meters full out sprint, then you walk. In other words, you're breaking it up. It's not just, you know, run for, you know, the next 30 minutes. This And so the soul, working with the soul is really the same. There are gonna be times when you're gonna wanna go fast and hard. There's gonna be times when you need to slow down, times when you need to stop, Teams, times when you need to go in fourth gear rather than sixth gear. And I always give my clients homework, but I always say it's optional. You don't have to do it. It's just for the people who wanna run faster or if you wanna run faster this week, here's some more that you can do on your own because my goal is to get you off of my tits where you're fully self-sufficient. Go ahead, Rob. What I say is uh, choosing to take no action is taking action. Yeah, and sometimes it's the best action because if you're forcing a decision, it usually gums up the works or it usually ends up in some kind of shit show if you're forcing action. All right, 
One more question. Therapist is trying to release me, uh, not addressing binary gates. Is it time for a new one now? Okay, binary gates is in my book. Uh, it's a major pivotal point, like chapter nine in my book, there's a hole in my love cup. And binary gates are basically those, that shit inside you, the primary messages you got it as a child boil down to three food groups of messages. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not wanted, I'm not good enough, and I don't matter. And those are the most destructive messages a child can get. And so what this person is saying is this the therapist is trying to release me. Now, that can be read two ways. And I'm not even sure I know, Margo, trying to release you as in trying to get you to move on and I don't want to work with you anymore or trying to get you to help you to release all of the pain and the fears and the bullshit beliefs inside of you, but they are not addressing the binary gates, the deeper stuff. Okay, that probably makes more sense. The therapist is trying to help you release all your crud but not addressing binary gates. Your therapist may have no idea in hell what binary gates are. And uh, right, but what you're really saying is not, your therapist isn't taking you deep enough, is what I really hear you saying. Now, the truth is, if your therapist is good in other ways, you can keep this therapy therapist and you can do the binary gate shit on your own. You really can. Um, but if you feel like your therapist is dragging you down or just can't keep up, and that's what I had to do that in my own self work, I just couldn't find a therapist who could move as fast as I needed to move. And I was moving in my own journaling in my own self work. So is it time for a new one? In all honesty, does it feel right? Does it feel like it's a time? You're actually asking that question it says there's probably a good indicator that you feel like this person isn't going deep enough for you. Um, and again, you guys, I create all these resources so that you can do this work on your own. Uh, go into further with uh, the binary gates in your own work in Love Cup, uh, pick up at Badass Wisdom, another tool. But there's some blockage that's keeping you from going deeper. Um, and feel free to reach out. Um, I get about a thousand messages a week across all platforms, but I, try, I strive to get, at to, at least, get to at least a couple hundred of them. So reach out on one of the platforms and direct message me. Um, just make the messages brief though, folks. If you do reach out, the briefer they are, not like half a sentence, but the briefer they are, the more likely I'll get to it because I just can't get to all the really, really long ones. So feel free to reach out, Margo. Um, TikTok is the one inbox that I get to least just because it's fucking loaded. So maybe try me over on Instagram or just reach out through the uh, website. But Instagram and Facebook, uh, instant messaging, I uh, usually, those are easiest to get to. But anyway, uh, you guys, this has been super duper fantastic, uh, delightful. Thank you so much for your great questions. And I, I tell you, you guys, you just ask great questions and it challenges me to bring out different insights I've learned. And I'm constantly learning from clients. There's just so much. And, and I love your questions. And I love that you guys have the courage to address these things you're struggling with and put them out there because everybody is always teaching everybody else. I have people on the show and they get counseling and I'll get people reaching out from as far away as literally Zimbabwe or literally uh, Tokyo or whatever and saying, wow, that client that you had on your show, wow, that person was going through what I was and I felt like I'm not alone. So for those of you who have put up questions today, thank you so much for putting your heart out there and your struggles out there because you're helping other people. Rob, any closing thoughts? KC is saying she doesn't have any. Do you have any closing thoughts, Rob? I am uh, was enjoying being part of the flow today, so thank you. Well, we had good flow. Thank you for making it so to everyone out there, on behalf of Casey and Rob, whether you are in Nepal or Zimbabwe or Belgrade or Billings, great to have you here and have a kick-ass day. The Badass Counseling Show is strictly copyrighted. No copies may be made without the express written consent of the Badass Counseling Show, LLC. The Badass Counseling Show is produced by Karen Camparelli and Robert H. Friedman. Executive producer, Sven Erlinson. Original music by two-time Emmy Award-winning composer Trevor Morris. Have a kick-ass day.